What's up guys, I'm Ira Shell, and this is The End Times. Our video, Who is Abaddon, the Angel of the Bottomless Pit, has gotten a lot of interesting feedback. So I figured, why not do a part two? If you haven't seen that video, I'd suggest you check it out, but if you've already seen it, then you know that we believe that Abaddon is Lucifer from Isaiah chapter 14. In fact, let's read those verses real quick. Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 through 20. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you were brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. This is the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who did not let his prisoners go home. All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb. But you were cast out away from your grave like a loathed branch clothed with the slain. Those pierced by the sword who go down to the stones of the pit like a dead body trampled underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land. You have slain your people. Now, if you're familiar with our other videos, you know that the word translated as Daystar isn't actually the word for Daystar. It's actually better translated as Lucifer. Now, someone actually asked a question, which I felt was a little sarcastic, but, but it doesn't matter. Let, I'll, I'll answer it here. They asked, how could a Latin word be in the Hebrew Bible? So let me explain. The Latin word? Lucifer isn't in the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew word in the Hebrew Bible is Hallel. The Latin word Lucifer is in the English translation of the Hebrew Bible. Now, with that said, let's move forward. Another thing I want to mention real quick before we get started is that Lucifer and Satan are not the same being. There isn't any biblical evidence that they are. They have two different falls, two different punishments, and two different descriptions of who they are. If you want to know more about their difference, check out our video from Lucifer to Satan, which is under our too deep category. Now with that said, the first thing I want you all to notice is that God refers to Lucifer as you who laid the nations low in verse 12. In other words, he overcame or conquered the nations. Another thing I want you to notice is that God said Lucifer's punishment is that he would be brought down to the far reaches of the pit in verse 15. Now if we fast forward to the time of John and John's vision of a bad and rising, he tells us all that comes out of the bottomless pit where Lucifer was previously thrown. Let's read that real quick. Revelation chapter 9 verses 1 through 12. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them, and their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it sting someone and in those days people will seek death and will not find it they will long to die but death will flee from them in appearance the locusts were like horses prepared for battle on their heads were what looked like crowns of gold their faces were like human faces their hair like women's hair and their teeth like lion's teeth they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. 
The first thing after the smoke that John saw were locusts. In scripture, especially prophetic and symbolic scripture, locusts usually are connected with an army. That's usually what they represent in prophetic and symbolic scripture. Now, I'm not saying that that's the sole meaning of locusts and prophecy or symbolism in the Bible, because it could have another meaning like how mountains have two meanings in Revelation chapter 17. But in this specific case, I believe that it represents a spiritual army. In fact, the locusts were described as being like horses prepared for battle and having breastplates like the breastplates of iron in verses 7 through 9. Now, after John describes the locusts that he saw, he says one other being comes out of the bottomless pit, Abaddon, the angel of the bottomless pit. Nothing else comes out of the bottomless pit, just these just the locust and Abaddon, yet Lucifer was thrown into the bottomless pit. It would then stand to reason that Abaddon, who is the leader of an entire spiritual army like locusts, would be Lucifer who was known according to God for conquering the nations. Now many try to argue that Abaddon wasn't evil but was God's righteous judgment without any evidence other than him being referred to as an angel in this verse or using texts that weren't in the Bible. So let me just address this. Angels aren't all good. If we read Revelation chapter 12, we see that Satan and his angels war against Michael and his angels. Then Satan and his angels are thrown down from heaven and no place was found for them. They aren't called demons. They aren't even called evil spirits. They're not even called unclean spirits. They're called angels. In fact, Jesus himself says that hell was created for the devil and his angels in Matthew 25 verse 41. So real quick, angels didn't become demons. We don't know where demons came from. Okay, back to what we were saying. Angels aren't a type of celestial being either. Doesn't mean that they're good. An angel simply is a job description. For more on that, check out our video, What Are Angels, which is under our Too Deep category. So just because he's called an angel doesn't mean that he is automatically good. In fact, it would more so mean that he's not good. Why? Because he came out of the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit is a place of punishment which is why Satan is thrown into the bottomless pit for a thousand years in Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 through 3. Not only is it a place of punishment, but it's specifically a place of temporary punishment. No one stays in the bottomless pit forever. It's a temporary holding cell. Satan is released after a thousand years. And another example is when Jesus meets Legion. Their fear was being tormented before the appointed time. What appointed time? The last judgment. In fact, they go as far as to beg Jesus not to send them to the abyss, which is the bottomless pit. You can find the full story of this in Mark chapter 5 verses 1 through 20 and Luke chapter 8 verses 26 through 39. Therefore, whoever comes out of the bottomless pit has to have been locked in there as a punishment. It's not just some horrible job as someone tried to say. Otherwise, why would he be released from his job to terrorize the inhabitants of the earth? That just doesn't make sense. Another reason people argue that Abaddon is good and that it's just a bad job because it says that he is the angel of the bottomless pit, as if that's his domain. Here's the problem with that. The original Greek doesn't say that he's the angel of the bottomless pit. It says Greek phrase. <laughs> In other words, the angel, the bottomless pit, or abyss. It could have just as easily been translated as the angel out of the bottomless pit or abyss. As John describes the beast out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 11 and Revelation 17. Besides, if Abaddon was created for the bottomless pit, he couldn't be an angel. As we stated in our video, what are angels, which is under a 2D category, Angels are created to have communication with the children of God. When the author of the book of Hebrews went into detail about Jesus being above all angels in chapter 1, the author ends it with the definition of what 
angels are. Hebrews 1 verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? You can't be a ministering spirit sent out to serve for the sake of the saints if you were created to be in the bottomless pit. Not just be created to be in the bottomless pit, but locked up in the bottomless pit and another being needs to unlock it with a key we see this in revelation chapter 9 verse 1 that just doesn't make sense the only reason someone would be in the bottomless pit is because they were being punished for something horrible so the only reason someone would be released from the bottomless pit is because they have served their time and their punishment is up the only being that was punished and thrown into the bottomless pit before Abaddon is released in the future is Lucifer of Isaiah 14. Therefore, if the only powerful being referred to as a king that's thrown into the bottomless pit is Lucifer, and the only powerful being referred to as a king that comes out of the bottomless pit is Abaddon, then it would stand to reason that they have to be the same being. With that said, let's move on. After John says that Abaddon is an angel, he begins to refer to him as something else throughout the rest of Revelation. Revelation chapter 11 verses 1 through 14 and Revelation chapter 17 both refer to Abaddon as the beast out of the bottomless pit. Now, some argued that there's no evidence that Abaddon and the beast out of the bottomless pit are the same. Again, if the only powerful being that comes out of the bottomless pit is Abaddon, and the only being that can defeat or destroy the two witnesses according to Revelation 11 is the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit, they would have to be the same being. Not only that, but there are three woes in Revelation. It's about to go back. And only two of them are actually described blatantly, saying the first woe and the second woe. The first woe is the release of Abaddon and his army according to Revelation chapter 9 verse 12. The second woe is the beast out of the bottomless pit, killing the two witnesses after their testimony is complete according to Revelation chapter 11 verse 14. After this, the beast out of the bottomless pit is seen ushering in Mystery Babylon on his back in Revelation chapter 17. Again, how can the beast out of the bottomless pit and Abaddon be two different beings if Abaddon in Revelation chapter 9 is the only being that is described as being powerful enough to do those two things? On top of that, Abaddon's release is the first woe. The second woe is Abaddon killing the two witnesses. That is a direct connection. Therefore, I do not see how anyone can say that Abaddon and the beast out of the bottomless pit are not the same being. They have to be the same being. Nothing else comes out of the bottomless pit that is powerful, that is a leader that can do what the beast out of the bottomless pit does. Now, as we said in our other videos, Mystery Babylon will consist of Israel and other countries. I think that that whole subject actually needs a video of its own. But for right now, here's the Lucifer connection. Abaddon is called King in Revelation chapter 9 verse 11. He then ushers in Mystery Babylon in Revelation chapter 17. Now, if we go back to Lucifer's prophecy, we'll find who the prophecy is addressed to. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 3 through 4. When the Lord has given you rest from your pain and turmoil and the hard service with which you were made to serve, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. Lucifer is referred to as the king of Babylon. Abaddon, who is a king, ushers in mystery Babylon. This isn't the only prophecy of the king of Babylon though. Let's fast forward to the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 25 verses 8 through 15 says, Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, Because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. I will devote them to destruction and make them a horror, a hissing, and an everlasting desolation. 
Moreover, I will banish from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the grinding of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Then after seventy years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and the nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. I will bring upon the land all the words that I have uttered against it, everything written in this book which Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall make slaves even of them, and I will recompense them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. According to Jeremiah's prophecy, specifically verse 11 and 12, the land of Israel and other nations shall serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. After these 70 years, God will punish the king of Babylon and make the land an everlasting waste. Now this prophecy is actually explained by another prophet. Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 through 27. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the sixty-two weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. It shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate, until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. We can be 100% sure without any shadow of a doubt that this is the same 70 years that Jeremiah prophesied about because Daniel actually says so. Daniel chapter 9 verses 1 through 2. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of the years that, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, seventy years. According to this, the 70 years of Jeremiah and the 70 weeks of Daniel are the same time period. Explaining the 70 years in detail needs a video of its own, which we're currently working on, but from what we currently understand, it consists of about four separate time periods, maybe more, but definitely the rebuilding of the second temple, the cutting off of an anointed one, the destruction of the second temple, and the coming prince. Now with that said, according to Daniel's prophecy, all of these things leads up to the decreed end that's coming. Jeremiah tells us that nations will serve the king of Babylon until the end of the 70 years. Now this makes sense because while Lucifer may still be in the bottomless pit, his authority and power, they weren't taken from him. This is similar to when Satan was thrown down to earth from heaven. He may have lost his ability to re-enter heaven, but he didn't lose his authority or power. For more on that, check out our video series, The Four Beasts of Daniel 7, which is under our The End Times category. Now, because Lucifer never lost his authority or power, it explains why when he rises from the bottomless pit, he's the only one who can defeat the two witnesses. This is because he still has authority over Israel, just as Jeremiah prophesied. Revelation chapter 11 verses 1 through 14 says, Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for forty-two months, and I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for twelve hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, 
fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third is soon to come. John was told specifically that he could measure the temple of God, the altar of God, and even those who worship there. But he couldn't measure the court outside the temple because it was given over to the nations. But the temple itself, the altar, and those who worship in there, they were still safe until Abaddon killed the two witnesses. Because the two witnesses was keeping that part of Israel, the temple, safe. Now the reason that Abaddon is the only one that could do that is because he's the king of Babylon. And according to Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 11 through 12, Israel and the other nations are still under his authority. This is why he's the only one that can usher in mystery Babylon recorded in Revelation chapter 17. Again, this makes sense why the two named or explained woes are both associated with Abaddon. The first, his release and the second, his destroying of the two witnesses. And the killing of the two witnesses, in a sense, actually solidified his reign as king. Now, while you guys think about that, let's sum everything up real quick. Abaddon and Lucifer are the same being. Lucifer was thrown down to the bottomless pit at the fall of Babylon. In that prophecy, he was referred to as the king of Babylon. The only king that comes out of the bottomless pit is Abaddon. The fact that Abaddon is released from the bottomless pit tells us that he wasn't in there because it was his job, but because he was being punished for something extremely bad. The bottomless pit is a place of temporary punishment because no one ever remains there for all eternity. After Abaddon is released from the bottomless pit, he goes out to destroy the two witnesses once they've completed their testimony. He's the only one who can actually defeat them because he's the only one who still has power and authority over Israel as well as other nations. This can be seen in Jeremiah's prophecy of the 70 years that Daniel explains will be the end of the desolations of Israel, which will be the actual end. So with all of that said, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if you did, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel. And until next time, God bless.